Ever wondered how crucial problem solving is in the object-oriented paradigm? Well, it's the foundation of crafting effective and efficient software solutions. The first step is understanding the problem. This involves defining the problem statement and comprehending its requirements. It may sound simple, but getting a clear grasp of the problem is akin to navigating through a thick fog. The trick is to break down the problem into manageable chunks. This allows us to focus on the essential details and prevents us from getting overwhelmed by the sheer size of the problem. Identifying the key entities, or actors, and the actions they perform is crucial. These entities could be anything from people, places to abstract concepts, and their actions form the basis of the functionality our software needs to provide. Remember, every great solution begins with a well-understood problem. As Charles Kettering once said, problems well stated are problems half solved. Objects are everywhere, but how do we identify them in the OU paradigm? In the realm of object-oriented programming, objects are the building blocks. They are the real-world entities that encapsulate both data and behavior. But how do we identify these objects? It's simpler than you might think. Consider a problem statement. As you read through it, pay close attention to the nouns and verbs. These often hint at potential objects and their associated behaviors. For instance, in a library system, book and borrow might stand out. Book could be an object, while borrow could be a behavior or method associated with that object. But remember, not all nouns make good objects. The trick is to focus on entities that hold significant information or have critical behaviors. It's about capturing the essence of the problem. Identifying the right objects is the first step towards building a robust solution. Understanding your objects lays a solid foundation for your class design, which we'll dive into in the next scene. From objects to classes. Let's see how they come into existence. Classes are the architects behind the objects we've identified. You can think of them as blueprints providing a layout for creating objects, complete with shared attributes and behaviors. To illustrate, let's consider a book class. It might have attributes like title, author, and ISBN representing the state of each object. But a book doesn't just exist, it does things too, right? That's where methods or functions come in. They represent the actions each object can perform. For our book, we might have a borrow method. Now we've got a book class with attributes and methods ready to be instantiated into objects. Each object will carry these attributes and methods, just like a house built from a blueprint carries the same design elements. Classes, the blueprints of our objects, form the backbone of our software. Everything is connected. Let's explore relationships in the OO paradigm. In this universe of objects we've created, they don't exist in isolation. They interact, they connect. And it's these relationships that make our software model feel more like the real world. Think of an association, a simple connection between objects. It's like saying, a library has books. But sometimes, relationships are more complex. That's where composition and aggregation come in, showing us how objects are structurally connected. In composition, if the parent object ceases to exist, so do its parts. An orchestra without musicians isn't an orchestra, right? But in aggregation, the parts can exist independently. A football team still has players, even without the team. These relationships, whether they are associations, compositions, or aggregations, are the ties that bind our objects together. They create a sense of order and structure in our software model. Establishing relationships between objects brings our software model closer to the real world. Hidden in plain sight, that's encapsulation for you. Encapsulation is like a magic trick, where a magician never reveals the secret behind their tricks. Similarly, in object-oriented programming, encapsulation is the practice of keeping the internal workings of our objects hidden from the outside world. This is achieved through data hiding, which involves defining private attributes and providing public methods, often known as getters and setters, for access. It's like having a secret recipe. You know the ingredients, but not the exact quantities or the cooking process. Then we have information hiding. This is where we shield unnecessary implementation details from external entities. It's like ordering a meal at a restaurant. You don't need to know how the dish is prepared. You just need to know how to order it. By encapsulating our code, we reduce complexity, enhance modularity, and ensure that our software remains easy to manage. Encapsulation ensures our software remains modular and manageable. Inheritance, the key to code reuse and simplification. 
As we delve into understanding inheritance, we uncover its power in object-oriented programming. Essentially, inheritance is the process where one class acquires the properties and functionalities of another class. The class being inherited from is known as the base class, while the class doing the inheriting is called the derived class. What makes inheritance so valuable? It's all about code reuse. When we identify common attributes and behaviors among objects, we can use inheritance to create a hierarchy of classes that share these common features. This allows us to write the shared code just once in the base class and then reuse it in the derived classes. The derived classes can also add their own unique features, making them specialized versions of the base class. This leads to a more efficient and organized code structure. With inheritance, we can build complex systems without duplicating code. One name, multiple behaviors. Welcome to the world of polymorphism. This is a crucial concept in object-oriented programming that allows us to use a single interface with different underlying forms. It's like having a universal remote that can control your TV, sound system, and even your smart lights, all with the same buttons. Let's dive into method overloading first. This is when we have multiple methods with the same name but different parameters within a class. Imagine it as a multi-tool pocket knife. One name, but different tools, or in this case, different parameters. Now, on to method overriding. Here we have derived classes that implement specific behaviors that override methods in the base class. Think of it like a default ringtone on your phone. It's there, it works, but you can override it with your favorite tune. In essence, polymorphism is about flexibility. It allows us to design more generalized and reusable code. Polymorphism allows our objects to behave in versatile ways, from static objects to dynamic behavior. Now that we've developed our classes, it's time to breathe life into them. We model the behavior of our objects by defining methods that modify their state. These methods, often termed as behaviors, are what differentiate one object from another even if they belong to the same class. Consider a car class. While all cars can drive, the way they drive can differ based on their make and model. Hence, the drive method for each car object could behave differently. Now let's talk about event-driven programming. It's a programming paradigm where the flow of the program is determined by events such as user actions, sensor outputs, or messages from other programs. Event-driven programming makes our software more interactive and responsive. It allows our objects to react to these events and perform appropriate actions or behaviors. Modeling behavior brings our objects to life. With behavior, our objects are no longer static. They're dynamic and interactive, just like entities in the real world. Testing, the unsung hero of software development. Like a master detective, it uncovers the hidden bugs and anomalies that can turn a smooth running software into a jittery mess. And it begins with unit testing, this process tests individual classes and methods, making sure each piece of the puzzle works perfectly on its own. But what about when these pieces come together? That's where integration testing steps in. It tests the interactions between classes, ensuring they play nicely together, just like an orchestra with every instrument in harmony. However, testing isn't just about finding problems. It's also about refining the design. Sometimes a test may reveal a better way to structure classes, methods, or relationships, leading to a more efficient and effective design. So let's remember testing is not just a final hurdle. It's an integral part of the development process, an essential tool in creating robust and reliable software. Testing ensures our software meets its requirements and performs reliably. Last but not least, documentation, the map to our software. Documentation is like the tour guide of our software project, guiding us through the intricacies and complexities of the code. Without it, even the most well-crafted software can become a labyrinth, challenging to navigate and understand. One crucial aspect of documentation is code comments. They're like breadcrumbs left by the developers, leading us through the logic, design decisions, and assumptions behind the code. They illuminate the thought processes that shape the software, making it easier for others to follow, maintain, and if necessary, modify the code. Another key component of documentation is Unified Modeling Language, or UML diagrams. These diagrams visually represent the classes, relationships, and interactions within our software, providing a bird's eye view of the system's structure and behavior. They're like the blueprints of a building, allowing us to see the big picture, 
Well-documented software is easier to maintain, understand and improve.